And we talked a lot in the last episode about why Antiochus is not getting what he needs out of Judea and Jerusalem and those lands there. And if you're wondering what that is, you can go back and listen to the previous episode because we spent an awful lot of time trying to understand what is happening in Judea. But I'm going to summarize it for you now. But if you're interested, you can go back to my first episode in the series where I have an interview with historian and ancient history professor Dr. Boris Krubasik discussing this time period. But the land of Jerusalem and Judea is in a middle of what we could almost describe as civil war. And I say it's almost civil war because it is not outright there are armies marching back and forth trying to conquer each other. But there is violence happening in fits and spurts in and amongst Jerusalem and the countryside immediately surrounding the city of Jerusalem. This is taking the form of cultural shocks and rejection over what's been happening, over what it means to be Jewish and what it even means to be Judean. There's groups of Judeans who do not like the influences of the Greek world of the Seleucids. And it's not even necessarily the Seleucids specifically because they were previously under the Ptolemies, who were also Greek-influenced dynasties. There are portions of people, some of them extravagantly wealthy, who are native Judeans and even natives of the city of Jerusalem, who are perfectly happy to work within the bounds of the Seleucid Empire or the Ptolemaic Empire. They're happy to collect taxes because they make a lot of money themselves. They are profiting over being part of the cogs of empire, whether it's Seleucids, whether it's Ptolemaic, whatever that is. And there are Greek goods flowing into the Judean countryside. There's Greek wine, Greek silverware, Greek pottery, Greek art. Greek cultural institutions are flowing in and amongst this land over the last few hundred years. And at some point there has been some boiling over, some rejection of this. And, and I'm trying to find, I've been racking my brain trying to find a good modern context for us to understand what's about to happen. And I, I can't think of any better analogy to what is about to happen than to expand upon the epic Star Wars analogy my guest, Dr. Boris Krubasik, made on my previous episode. Boris compared this world to the recent Star Wars series, Andor, and I think he hit the nail right on the head because in the world of Andor, this is the early empire. It is just the nascent forming of the rebellion that everybody knows about that eventually leads to Luke Skywalker and all that sort of stuff. But in the world of Andor, there are people happily working within the bounds of the evil quote-unquote galactic empire. There are people making lots of money, being part of the empire. There are people within the ruling body of the empire, the senate, that are happily working with it, looking to expand upon it. And there are people within that same government, not at all happy 
with the Empire. And they're looking to support rebellion, looking to stoke the fires of rebellion. And some of them are doing it secretly. There are groups of people doing it openly. And I think that this is a interesting analogy that probably hits the nail on the head about what is happening in this world. There's rebellion happening and the Empire doesn't even really realize it's happening. It's like a kind of civil war, but not civil war. Rebellion, but not rebellion. It takes the form of rival groups of Jewish people and in the city of Jerusalem are these same groups of people and in the countryside of surrounding Jerusalem the Judean countryside these are these same groups of people that are not agreeing with what it means to be Jewish and this is becoming such a significant problem that there are flashpoints that erupt and express themselves in violence. And the focus of that violence is the Greek culture of the empires which they have been under for the last eight generations or so. The Greek culture, the Greek silverware, the Greek wine, the Greek pottery, the Greek art the Greek cultural institutions, the Greek names people are adopting, whether they're the everybody person in the countryside or part of the nobility. Names like Aristobulus, names like Alexander, Alexandra, Simon, Ptolemy. These are all names that are Greek roots in them, worming their way, becoming part of the Judean and Jewish culture. And there are groups of people rejecting this, but there are groups of people that think, this is perfectly fine. Give me more of that Greek wine. It tastes better than the crap we've got locally. I like this Greek art. It looks nice. I'm happy to have it on the wall. I like the Greek empire that I'm a part of because I'm able to move my goods around all over this countryside and I don't got to pay tithes and taxes to get stuff around. I don't have to worry about being attacked by roaming people on the countryside because the world's at peace. I don't have to worry about the Sumerians attacking me or the Edomians attacking me if I'm moving my goods around. Because we're all part of the same empire. There's a certain peace that enables culture to spread, business to spread, economies to grow. This is the world of empire, and even though these empires are fighting back and forth, this doesn't necessarily have a lot of big impacts on the cities or the farms. You know, in this time, empire, the battles, they fought outside and you know set piece battles one battle you know it was done all it changed was who the tax man was this is the world that's happening and their their rejection of this greekness there's growing groups that are angry about this it would be disrupting tax gathering it would be disrupting trade it would be causing governors to have to spend money on soldiers and troops moving around the countryside trying to enforce the law and so you can imagine our Seleucid overlord wanting his taxes wanting his money needing taxes needing money in order to build armies in case the romans come and get them in case the ptolemies come and try to take back the land that he had just got won in case the persians start um, attacking the 
western borders, or pardon me, wait, attacking the eastern borders of the empire. So there's a lot of pressure in the Seleucid world to have peaceful lands, well-collected taxes, and ties of soldiers, and ties of slaves. This is the world, and the Judean countryside is not participating this as optimally as it should be, not according to the Seleucids anyway. And so the Seleucids have to send people over here. They got to take time to say, you know, what the heck is going This is a teeny little piece of my empire. Why is it causing me so much problem? And you'd have to wonder, why would you even care if it is such a tiny piece of land? But of course, in our last episode, we've learned that since the start of what we would call the Second Temple period, when the city of Jerusalem was rebuilt under the Persian Empire, Jerusalem and the surrounding lands have been well developed, and it is becoming a powerful economy, and there is a lot of tax money and goods and services and such whatnot to be had within the city of Jerusalem and the surrounding lands. And so Antiochus needs this sorted out. This is a, you know, a, a small little piece of land punching above its weight class in terms of its economy. So there's a lot of wealth to be extracted from that. 